who's been to Los Angeles? Uh, Los Angeles County was a leading agricultural county in the United States into, into the 1950s, but you didn't know that. So it grew some of the best citrus and orange trees in the world. World War II and the, uh, and the industry that sprung up there and making Hollywood changed Los Angeles. And today it's known for its movies and their and freeways. You don't find very many orange trees. And the other great example is Silicon Valley. When I was a kid, Silicon Valley was called the Valley of Heart's Delight. When you went there in the spring, it was full of orchards and flowers. When I was in uh, studying soils, it was used as, as a place with some of the deepest allu alluvial soils in the world. It happens to have just the right climate, just the right soils, and, and really clean water for growing some of the most flavorful plums and apricots and, and fruits that you can find anywhere in the world. And until the 60s, Silicon Valley was the largest fruit growing and packing area in the world. You can't, you, you'd be pressed to find an orchard in Silicon Valley. So my point is that we need to protect those places that are appropriate for growing food. And I don't think I'm wrong to say there's more of them are not being made, and they're not easy to create. So it's a down arrow, is that what this, the way this thing works? Good. So we, we started in this little valley in 1980. By 1985, I was bored, and we began, we moved, uh, we took a trip down to this place down here, the tip of the Baja Peninsula, and we found a group of a, a agricultural community, small growers of one to two acres, some three and four, and they all had the same problem. They didn't have a market for what they were growing, but they were all great farmers. And we decided to develop a new business and with a very clear goal, and that goal was to improve the standard of living, the quality of life for the people living in that community. And that evolved into something bigger, a, a company called, or a brand called Del Cabo. And over the last 30 years, has expanded to working in over 10 different communities up and down the Baja Peninsula. And the, in the last year, we began working in Sonora with a group of Yaqui, Mayo, Native American Indians. And the point of Del Cabo was to teach families how to grow food without all the chemicals, without all the poisons. And, it, and to introduce them to the things that they're already growing, crops that had a, a market and demand in a global marketplace. We were targeting in the beginning California, and that later became the United States, and later became Canada. And today you'll find El Cabo products as far away as Abu Dhabi and Singapore. But there's a lot growing that goes into growing one healthy tomato flower. Oops. Now how did that happen? That's okay. And, and when Carr first called me up and asked me if I would make the time to come out here, I had in my mind that I would walk you through the trials and tribulations of taking a seed, planting it, and producing a truckload of cherry tomatoes. But when I got the questions back, I thought, ah, we're not going to do that. But we'll talk about it a little bit. And so it doesn't really matter if you prepare the soil with shovels like these women are doing in a farm north of Shanghai, or if you start with a D6 cap and get a, a big disc, these are big 
uh, round circles that are sharp that rotate and are pulled behind a tractor and drive through a field. Whether you, you're farming conventionally or you're farming organically, the process is the same. The first thing you have to do is make a place to plant the seed or, tra or plant the transplants. And you can't do it where there's other things growing. So the first thing you have to do is kill everything that's out there. Prepare the soil and make the bed, a soil bed that's appropriate for growing a plant. On, on the farm in California, in the farm in Mexico, we use John Deere tractors. After we run through with the discs, we go through with a, a chisel. It's a, an implement that's oh, about three feet, it rips, a, it rips a, a, a hole in the ground about three feet deep. Sounds pretty dramatic. But the whole reason we do it is to, we're trying to open up the soil so roots can penetrate down. And when you grow a plant, when you know when we walk out in the field, you look at all these plants or you look at a tree, all we see is what's growing above the ground, but really the action is below your feet. That's really where, where everything is happening. That's where there's one handful of soil has over seven billion things living. But we we miss that. We don't think about it too often. So back to planting these plants. So you get the, your bed going. So the one big difference between the way we're farming and the way the a conventional farmer farm is in how we deal with our weeds. So now we've spent all this energy, spent all this diesel fuel, disking the field and getting it ready to plant. And, then, and we don't want weeds to come back. Or if they do come back when we plant, then we're gonna have, we're gonna have to battle with them. And that's the biggest difference in cost, going to one of the questions from one of you, between farming organically and farming conventionally is the cost of managing the weeds that come up when you're growing the crop. So in this operation, they were doing it by hand. In California and in Mexico, we do a combination of things. Now, if we were farming conventionally, we'd have a shopping list of herbicides that we could use. But we don't do that. So when, when I first started, I didn't know any better. And we just went, went out and planted the field as soon as we got it prepped. And we irrigated. And the first thing that happened was all these weeds came up. And the weeds were happier than the plants we planted. And they grew faster than the plants we planted. And it was a problem. So the next time we did it, we watered the field before we planted. And all the weeds came up. Now we had a chance to go after the weeds. So the, there's three tricks. One is you can go through and cultivate the soil half to one inch deep, and that kills all these little weeds that are coming up. Again, you're killing things. The other is you can mount a propane tank behind a tractor, and you can flame the weeds. Now, flaming is an old technology that was used in the 30s or 40s, and it's coming back. And it's a, a really nice way to get rid of weeds that are freshly emerged without disturbing the soil. And the reason you don't want to disturb the soil is because when you do disturb the soil, there's more seed, weed seeds that come up. And the last technique is to use a, a strong vinegar. And there is a product now available for organic growers. It's basically vinegar that burns back the weed seeds. And the, the reason I'm talking about weeds is only because I want to make the distinction between organic growers and conventional growers. And that's a big challenge for the organic guys, how to deal with the plants that you don't want there. So we've got our plant seeded or transplanted. If you're growing cherry tomatoes or sugar snap peas or grapes or some kinds of berries, you have to stake them and you have to tie them up and run string. So every three, four feet, you put a stake in the ground. And the reason I'm going through this is I'm trying to get across to you the idea that there's a lot of work involved in growing one cherry tomato. When you go to the store and buy a little package of a tomato or a cucumber, there's an enormous effort 
gone into growing that one fruit. It's not trivial. It's a lot easier to write a computer program. But you get paid less for doing it, believe me. So along the way, this is, a, this is a photograph of the tip of the Baja. This is taken in 1987. And what this young man's doing is opening up, it's going to open up a, a hole right here in this trench and allow water from this, from this trench to, to run down this row of basil. That's not what, the way we do it today. But to get to the point of stringing, those of stringing up those tomatoes or getting to the point of harvesting, which is really where you want to get to, there's a lot of steps in between. You've got to bring water to that plant, unless you're in a place where it rains enough. You've got to go through and, and deal with the weeds that periodically come up. And you've got to deal with any other problems that come up. So there's this process that goes on after seeding. And for cherry tomatoes, it's about two to three months of tending these plants, going out there every day and doing something. You know, watering, cultivating, or dealing with some, some kind of problem that you have in that field. So one of, the, one of the things we did to mitigate the massive amount of weeds will come up when we furrow irrigated was we switched all our growers over to drip irrigation. So drip irrigation is a it's a great technology. It reduces the amount of water you use. And it puts the water where, where the plant needs it. So instead of getting everything wet out here and all the weeds coming up and then you have to go through and cultivate it, it is just getting it wet close to the plant. So drip irrigation does two things. It puts water where you want it. It, limit, it, it minimizes the amount of weeds you're having to deal with, and it reduces the amount of water you're using. So that's a little bit of a background, and that's the really quick story on how to grow the plant, which was going to be the whole talk. But I, I want, what I want to do right now is frame the conversation with three questions. Is soil a medium? or a soil, a habitat. Does that make sense? Is it a place where roots grow, or is it a place where things grow? Are we manufacturing our food, or are we nurturing plants? And are insects good or are insects bad? So this a little history about the traditional paradigm or the paradigm of the industrial agricultural, how food is produced. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Justice von Liebig, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but he was a He was a famous teacher. He was really well known as a chemistry teacher. And he became known as the father of, of the fertilizer industry. There was the guy that discovered that nitrogen is important for plants to grow. And he came up with this idea called Liebig's Law, the Law of Minimum, which was that plants need a certain amount of food to grow. And above that, they don't, it doesn't do any good. So, if you give them so much nitrogen, if you have below a certain amount of nitrogen, they're not going to grow. And above that, it's, it's excess. They don't need it. And the same thing for, these, for the other chemicals. And, live, and he felt like we could figure out all the chemicals that plants need to grow. And you can grow a plant with just chemicals. And his students went on to promote that idea. And in the beginning, there was quite a bit of pushback from farmers. This doesn't make any sense. You can't do this with chemicals. But slowly but surely, this became the, the prevalent thinking. And when I was in, I went to a, 
a school in California, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, it was an ag school. And I took a fertilizer class. And they taught me about this kind of stuff. And they taught me that you needed 120 to 175 pounds of nitrogen per acre to grow a tomato. And you needed so many pounds of phosphorus to grow a tomato. And you needed 60 to 240 pounds of potassium to grow a tomato. And that that's how you did it. So I was taught you go get a, do a soil test. Based on that soil test, you decide on how much fertilizer to buy. As an organic grower, we don't do it too much different, except we don't, I don't think about it as chemistry. But we do a soil test. And we do think about nutrients, but we get there in a different way. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So who hasn't read The Cat in the Hat? Great, it's unanimous. My favorite was green eggs and ham. But I bet you didn't know that Dr. Seuss worked for Standard Oil and wrote some of the first advertisements for pesticides. Did anybody know that? So this is, this is my favorite part of today. Dr. Seuss, he invented the idea, Quick Henry, the flit. And flit was a a pesticide that became, this became a household word. Everybody knew that if you had a insect in the house, get the flint. When beasts like this can't stand one blast, how long do you think a bug can last? When someone says, quick Henry the flint, I've got one more of these. When beasts like this won't leave their lairs, mere insects better say their prayers. When someone says, quick Henry the flit, say it, spray it, slay it. And that's been our motto ever since. So it's easy to look, it's easy to critique. It's, it's better to understand where this is coming from. So if we look back, like today, there's a, an information revolution. In the 30s and 40s and 50s, there was a chemistry revolution. Plastics. Do you remember the, the movie? What was the movie with Graduate. the graduate? Go into plastics, that's where your career is. It, as a farmer, if you came out to my field and I had a field infested with aphids or some kind of, spit off some kind of worm, and you showed me that you sprayed a little DT, DDT out there and the worms just dropped dead off the plants, I want it. So in the context of the times, this was real innovation. And we didn't understand the long-term implications of a lot of these materials, these man materials. Rachel Carson didn't come along until the 1960s. So in a couple of those papers, the Florida paper on growing tomatoes, I think the other one's a Tennessee paper, it went through all the materials you, you can use to grow a tomato plant. Malathion, endosulfan, dimethoate, diazinon, chlorpyrifos. It's a long list of chemicals to slay it, to kill those bugs. And for weed management, it's the same thing. There's chemicals to kill the plants before before your seedlings emerge, there's pre-emergent herbicides, there's post-emergent herbicides. There's even herbicides to defoliate cotton. Diquat is used for that. And then of course there's 
another shopping list of chemicals to manage plant diseases. So there's two kinds of plant diseases. There's foliar plant diseases, and there's soil plant diseases. And they're a real challenge. If you've got a field of green beans, and all of a sudden you're, you're getting a, a virus disease in those green beans, or you're growing onions, and you get a, a, a soil disease on those onions, what do you do? So, so just for a minute, pre pre pretend you're a farmer, and you've got this crop. And you're about, you, you're going to lose the crop. And you've borrowed money to grow it. And somebody comes up to you and says, well, you, know, you, can, you can use retinoil, and that will solve your problem. So these chemicals serve their purpose, and, they're, and they solve in difficult growing problems for farmers. So we've developed this paradigm in the last, in this, in the last 50 years, 60 years, that plants depend on chemicals, starting with a famous chemist, and that only good bug, the only good bug is a dead bug. And the idea really got a big push with Dr. Zeus. In some ways, that's where we are today. But I like to say that there's an older, not old, an older new paradigm that's also becoming uh, prevalent in today's thinking is being taught in universities. And the, the reason I would say older, and not just old, shows on the screen, it's because many of the ideas and the concepts for farming that are used by organic growers were good, were good stewardship practices that the Greeks and Romans knew about. Feed, the idea of feeding the soil, that might be a little different than that. They didn't understand that the, the soil was composed of lots of different organisms that interact with plants and interact with each other. But feeding the soil is really at the essence of growing a plant and, gr and farming organically. Remember what I said when we started, you look at a plant or a tree, there's more of that, more of it is underground than above ground. And the factory, the, 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 uh, the mechanism for the plant getting its nutrients is all happening below ground. Yes, it's a big solar collector. all the nutrients that it needs, the vitamins, if you will, and that's all coming from the soil. So feeding the soil is important because a lot is happening in the soil. Rotating plants, and that's an old idea. And it's part of the, in some, in some places it's part of the problem where farmers pay a lot of money for rents and they feel compelled to plant the most high value crop over and over again. And they, they don't have the luxury to rotate to a lesser value crop or to fallow a field. Fallow meaning rest the field. But rotating, the, rotating crops changes, you're, you're changing what the depth of roots are in the ground, you're changing the way the, uh, up the, the kind of plant, the way it's interacting with the, with the nutrients in the soil, you're changing the uh, the signals that are being sent out by the plant into the field. So whatever might build up to attack your plant is now got something else to, to feed on that might not be so attractive. So rotation is important. Then this idea of working with insects instead of thinking of them as your enemy. So, so this idea of biological control. And one of the classic examples of biological control was in Los Angeles County, there was a, a, uh, a scale that infected the orange trees. And the farmers thought that they were, the entire industry was going to go down, that the scale was going to wipe out the citrus growing in, in Los Angeles County. Remember, this was a big agricultural center at the time. And USDA sent some entomologists out in the world to try to find out where this scale came from. 
And they discovered that the scale came from Australia. And they identified some insects that lived on the scale. And they shipped them back. This was, they had to ship them back on boats because there were no planes at the time. And they brought them back. And they, they netted some of these branch, these citrus trees that were full of these scales. And they released some of the different species that they brought back from Australia. And one of the species they brought back was a Vidalia beetle. And you can look up the story. And one of the agronomists came back sometime later and looked at the bag and saw the bag, was, the tree was full of scale and saw the scale had been, was gone. And the, and the branch was full of Vidalia beetles. So he took some of the Vidalia beetles and he moved them to another tree and another branch was back. And the same thing happened. And that initiated the release of Vidalia beetles as a control for the scale. And the problem went away. Until something in the 60s or the 70s, it popped up again in the San Joaquin Valley. Nobody knew why. And they were going to start spraying all over again to try to kill the scale. And some extension worker looked it up and thought, oh, Vidalia beetle. We solved this problem before. And realized that they had knocked down the Vidalia beetle because of the insecticide spray that they were doing. And he went out and found it someplace else and moved it back into these orchards where they're having the problem. So this is just a great example how insects can be your friend. They can solve problems. So working with, working with insects. And then the last point is observing and managing the whole system. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. So I want to dive a little bit into feeding the soil because I think that's really important. Cover cropping or green manure crops. Does everybody know what that is? Who doesn't know what that is? Raise your hand. Cover crops and green manure crops. Everybody knows what that is. Great. Pretty much? They're really important. So, so I, there was a question of how do you do cover crops or green manure crops and how is it affordable? Well, on the West Coast, we do it in the, in the winter time in the rainy season. So it's when we don't have a crop growing. And if it's a perennial crop, there's a period of time when we take it out and then we do a cover crop. It's a period of time of resting the soil. It's a time when we're not going to plant the crop. At the tip of the Baja and in Mexico, we do it in the summertime because it's hot and it's, it's the period of time when we're not growing a crop for export. D different mixtures of plants. A lot of people think of cover crops as legumes. Legumes are plants that fix nitrogen. Plants that fix nitrogen have a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria that lives in the soil, a rhizobium. If you pull up a bean plant that's, that's been this fixing nitrogen and has this bacteria in the, in the roots, you'll see little nodules on the roots. If you pop open those nodules and you break them open with your, with your thumb or with your fingernails, you'll see their sort of red color inside. Well, that's the bacteria fixing nitrogen from the air. And when it fixes nitrogen from the air, it makes that nitrogen available to the plant. So but when we grow a cover crop, we don't do it with just leguminous plants. We're not doing it just to fix nitrogen. We're doing it to increase the amount of organic matter in that field. We're doing it to add organic matter back into the soil to feed bacteria, fungi, actinomyces, worms, and everything else that's living there to bring that soil alive. Because we've learned with time that there's, there's things in that soil that help the plants grow better. There's a whole group of Bacillus subtilis. There's a species of bacteria that's found in soil. And recently a group of researchers from the University of Delaware found that when that, that, that this particular bacteria signals a plant to close the stomata when a plant disease is feeding on the leaves. So some of these plant diseases, they'll, they'll send out a little spore, the spore will grow, the spore will then penetrate into the stomata on the leaf. But if the plant can close the stomata, it's protected. And somehow there's this interaction, this peculiar interaction between this bacteria in the soil in the roots 
that signals the plant and closes those stomata. So feeding the soil is important. Compost. People think of compost as a fertilizer. It's not a fertilizer. Compost is an inoculant of bacteria. When you make compost, you're aerobically breaking down organic matter. And you get this massive amount of fungi and bacteria. And so when we use compost, I think of compost as a way of inoculating my soil with more bacteria. pH, the acidity or alkalinity of the soil, is critical to the plant's ability to access the nutrients in the soil. So we, we always start by a soil test, and one of the first things I look at is pH. And a, in, in the south, where the pH is high, where the soil is our alkaline, we use sulfur to lower the pH in the soil. Here in the northeast, you could use shells, but it's commonly lime is used to bring the pH up because the soil has become acidic. In organic ag, we use rock phosphate. It breaks down slowly in the soil. And then down at the tip of the Baja and all the way up in that desert area, we have a big problem with, with nematodes, nematodes. And we found that crab meal suppresses the nematodes. Now, why would crab meal suppress nematodes? It turns out that crab meal has a lot of chitin in it. So, so think of the skin, the skin of a shrimp. And the chitin feeds a fungus that attacks the nematodes. So when we use crab meal as part of our fertility program, we augment the populations of the fungus that feed on the nematodes. And I like to use seaweed because it has all, lots of different micronutrients and has some plant hormones in it. And then for growing potatoes, uh, growing tomatoes, excuse me, we found that if in sandy soils, where the potassium cation, it's a plus one cation, easily leaches with rain or irrigation water, it, be, it moves down below the root zone, that we needed to supplement the feeding of the plant for, with potassium, because when the fruit forms, the plant is pulling potassium into that fruit to, to form the structure and the skin of the fruit. It makes it firm. And if there's not enough potassium available to that fruit, and in the soil matrix at the time, the fruit is soft. It's still good. If I was in my backyard, I wouldn't, I wouldn't need it. But because we're shipping it to you, we need that fruit to be firm because people don't like soft tomatoes. So just a visual of a cover crop. It's about three to four feet high. This is in Pescadero. It's a mixture of a legume, which is the which is this plant. This is, this is, a, this is a fava bean. It's, a, it's really a bell bean. It's a little related to a fava bean. We use oats and vetch, about 30, 30, 30. A lot of guys are working on what's the best mixture to get good weed suppression, to get, you know, optimize your organic matter or optimize the increase in nitrogen from the legume. And in Mexico, we use corn and cowpeas. Cowpeas is a, is a legume. The corn gives us massive amounts of organic matter. So, and that's us making compost. So that's our fertility program, and that replaces buying urea or a 20-20-20 fertilizer or some other chemical fertilizer. I want to stay on the fertilizer thing and tell you a story about uh, that I heard at a conference a soil scientist was working in the Midwest, and he was a he was a grad student, and he kept hearing stories from the in the community that the uh, that the organic farmers growing corn didn't have as many worms in his field as the conventional farmer. And he thought that's odd; it can't be true. So he went out. His, he decided to do his uh, his uh, graduate work and, and to determine if this was really true or not. So. He identified some organic farms and some conventional farms. And one, the one that I remember strikes me that there was one, on one side of the railroad track was an organic farm, and the other side of the railroad track was a conventional farm. And he went out and counted the worms on the leaves of the corn plants. And sure enough, 
The organic farm had less worms than the conventional farm. How weird is that? So then he said, well, why? How can this possibly be? They're in the same place. They're exposed to the same climate. They're right across the river tracks from each other. So we began doing pedial analysis of the corn plant and soil analysis. And he found that there was a direct relationship in the, in the ratio of nutrients in the corn plant leaf. And he was able to, just by looking at the ratio, I, I'm trying to remember if it was phosphorus and calcium, I have to go back and look at the paper, but whatever it was, that he could tell you how many worms he would find in the field based on that ratio. And what he concluded was that because of the way the corn, the organic farmer was fertilizing his field, for some reason those corn plants weren't as attractive or weren't drawing in as many butterflies or moths that were laying the eggs that were making the worms. So a little bit about crop rotations. Uh, there's a, uh, in the middle of the Baja Peninsula, there's a place called Mulahe, and these, there's eight families we're working with there, and they came up with the rotation all by themselves. And I was surprised when I go there because they hardly ever have any pest problems. They don't, they don't bring anything outside, hardly anything outside the area for, 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 to add for, for the fertility program. They were growing, they were raising cows for milk, and so they had alfalfa. But when I first showed up, there was mostly alfalfa fields. And what they decided to do was they grow, now what they do is they grow alfalfa for three years, then they plant a tomato crop, or excuse me, and then they add some compost, and they plant a tomato crop. They make the compost with some of the alfalfa and the manure from their horse, from their cattle. After the tomato crop, the next year they plant peas. Peas are a legume. After the peas, they plant garlic, one year, two years, three years. And then they go back and plant alfalfa for three years. And they've been doing this for 15 years. Pretty sustainable system. And something's working really well there because there's hardly any pest pressure. Another rotation at the tip of the Baja where we're not growing as many crops is cherry tomatoes, then a, then a cover crop of corn and cow peas. Then we add some compost and we disc it in, grow basil. Then we go back and grow this cover crop in the summer of corn and cow peas, add some compost, and then cherry tomatoes again. Seems to be working. 25 years. So it's a lot of work. Can you do it on a commercial scale? The field of cherry tomatoes. You notice that there are, there's these bands of sunflower and corn, it's a sorghum plant, and below it are cilantro that are scattered throughout this field. And we do that specifically to provide habitat for insects. But things, things do go wrong. We do have pests. <coughs> I was just down there two weeks ago, and that's a, a, an army worm, Spidoptera. And there were hundreds of them in this one field. And I was finding two species of, of true bugs. One was a, I'll throw a name, a leptoglossus was one. And there one, another one was a, a, um, an helticus. Anyway, two bugs. And there were, something was drastically wrong. So I called in the expert, the gentleman with the insect net is a retired USDA ARS. Uh, entomologist and researcher who's been uh, kind enough to help us with some of our some of our problems and I'm looking at a that little yellow tube I don't know if you can see it from the back has sticky paper on it and the sticky paper insects that are flying by the ones that are the, the guys that don't have very much luck and happen to run in the sticky paper get trapped there and that's the end of them but I get to count them so we're we're out there trying to figure out what's going on. Why all of a sudden are all these army worms out there and why are we having these two new bugs in these fields that are feeding on the tomatoes? So the, really the point is we're, we're trying to understand the system. 
we're seeing this system, something's out of whack. So managing insects without that big shopping list of chemicals we saw in the beginning, you know, half an hour ago, is not without, it's not like we don't have some tools. There are bacteria that insects eat that make them sick. And so the one that was, uh, you know, the way I heard the story was that there was a gardener who saw some black larvae hanging down from his tomato plants and they looked like they were dying. So he picked them off the plant and he threw them in his blender and he added some water and he sprayed on that plant. And somebody figured out that that was Bacillus thuringiensis. I don't know if the story is too true, but it sounds good. But Bacillus thuringiensis is a, a stomach disease of worms. You don't want to get it because it kills you if you're a worm. It doesn't affect us. And it's commercially available. And a lot of conventional growers now are using it because it doesn't hurt anything else. It just hurts worms that eat plants. And there are, back, there are fungi today available. I remember about in the middle 1980s, we began working with some Bavarians, a, a fungus that make insects sick. So there are tools in, biology, in, in, in nature that can be used to control insects that are not, instead of using chemicals that we've developed in laboratories that nature hasn't learned to deal with, that there are no enzymes out there in the soil to break down or in our bodies. There's also this whole universe of insect predators and insect parasitoids. I mean, it's, it's really a jungle out there. The insects are trying to eat plants. The plants are trying to defend themselves. The insects, they're all making different kinds of chemicals. There's insects trying to eat insects. There's insects laying eggs in insects. It's really wild. And flowers are an important part of all this because flowers have nectar. Nectars are high in sugar. So a lot of the parasitoids, these little wasps, a lot of the predators, they need a sugar source. So flowers are it. And you've got to choose, you got to pick the right kind of flowers because a lot of these critters have big heads. They don't have a long proboscis that they can, like, or they, they don't have a big long beak and a tongue like a hummingbird and they can't get into a sage flower. So you've got to pick the right kind of flowers. <clears throat> this is a green stink bug. They call it a stink bug because when you squish it, it stinks. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the entomology world, it's uh, formerly known as Nazara verulula. Verulula. This thing showed up at the tip of the Baja in the early 1990s. It, had, it wasn't there before. Uh, I, at least I had never seen it there before. And we used to harvest cherry tomatoes into June without any problems. And by middle of March, we were starting to see a lot of discoloration of the cherry tomatoes. And when you ate them, they would be off flavor. Well, this little, this is a true bug. This is as opposed to an untrue bug. <laughs> so insects, bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. So this is, this is a true bug in the order of Hitteroptera. And it has a, a mouth part that's a piercing mouth part. It doesn't chew has a little needle that sticks into the plant. In fact, inside that needle are two little tubes. And out of one tube, it injects into the fruit the saliva that breaks down the tissue inside the fruit. And the other tube is like a straw, which it sucks it up. But when it injects that saliva into the tube, it makes the fruit taste terrible. And it discolors it. So it got to the point where 30 to 50% of the cherry tomatoes were ruined. And we had to do something about this green stink bug. And the, our, of course, our first reaction is, where's the flint? How do you kill this guy? <laughs> but it didn't work, because this is like a little tank out there. And probably the most obnoxious material that we use is an extract from a, from a flower, a chrysanthemum flower, that's commercially grown in Tanzania and Kenya and made into a pesticide. That's, convert, that's sold as Pyganic. And so a lot of our growers, they like to use the Pyganic because it kills the bugs, right? But it didn't do a very good job on this guy. So 
we went out and tried to understand and learn about this insect. And we found that there was a little tiny wasp. This thing is really tiny. I mean, it's <laughs> tiny. And it, it lays its eggs, it, lay, it lays its eggs in the eggs of a stink bug. And it's tuned into the stink bug. It, it's like a guided missile finding its eggs. So all we had to do was go find this wasp and bring it over to the tip of the Baja. And we were fortunate to learn that there was a lab, a USDA quarantine lab in Texas that had been working with this insect and had been breeding, had a colony of it that was clean. Clean meaning there were no hyperparasites on this insect because there are parasites of parasites. And if you're going to bring a parasite in, you don't want to bring in its parasites, right? And this lab had also worked to make sure that this parasite doesn't parasitize some of the good guys because there's a lot of other insects, there's a lot of pollinators that could do some damage. So we were pretty sure that this was a clean insect, that it wasn't going to do any damage to the environment. And we had a friend there a friend of a friend in the lab who slipped us a little, it was like a little piece of paper with a bunch of eggs on it. And I put the eggs in my pocket and I went back down to Mexico and we put them in a glass jar with a, with a, uh, a net over the top and out of the eggs came this little critter. And we grew these things out. And we got really good at raising stink bugs because you, you had to have the stink bugs to lay the eggs to put the wasp in with the eggs so that it would <coughs> lay its eggs inside the eggs of the stink bug. And then we collected th th hundreds of thousands of these wasps and began releasing them in the fields. And two years later, in fact today, you can't find this species in the field. Yeah, you can find it, but it's not, the, I have to go back one slide. You can find it in the field, but it's not doing damage to our crop. There's a few of them out there. So we successfully introduced this, uh, this wasp, Trisolacus basalis, solving our problem. And, and that's what we're doing today with the, with the problems that we, we solved two weeks ago. And what we learned was that these new insects, these new bugs that we found that are multiplying in our fields and causing damage to the crop, are, they came without passports. They came illegally. They just they showed up in somebody's bag. They came on a truck. They came on an airplane. They came on somebody's fruit. But they came without their host of predators and parasitoids. And so when they found their tomato field, they go, ooh, dessert. So our job now is to bring the system back into balance. And while we were doing that, we were looking at what, what out there is eating them. We found that this, this is a zealous assassin bug. We found the assassin bug periodically attacking some of these critters that we don't want. And just, just coincidentally, this is an a insect lure that's being held, this green thing. And we were out there putting out different kinds of chemicals to see what chemicals we could introduce into the fields to trap more predators, this is zealous as a predator, to increase the predation in the field. I don't know if, I, I kind of doubt that this was a, um, this was methyl salicylate, is what this is. It uh, comes from a plant, it smells like a flower. And it just so happens that the assassin bug was laying its eggs on the lure. And this, of course, is the classic beneficial insect, right? The ladybug. Now, I'll tell you one, my favorite ladybug story was in, was in a field near Ensenada. The hills were dry, and we got this migration of aphids in this tomato field. And a young man who was in charge of the field said, Larry, we've got to spread this field. What are you going to do? I'm crawling around the field, and about every fifth plant, I saw a ladybug. I said, wait. Let's just wait a couple of days and see what happens. Three days later, there was a ladybug on every plant. So behind this migration of aphids came a migration of ladybugs. And a week later, neither ladybug nor aphid was, was, was to be found. So nature's, nature's 
has a lot to teach us, a pretty amazing thing. Species diversity helps by having different species in a field. You're sending out different kinds of chemicals, you're confusing insects, and you're providing habitats for different insects. And mixing your crops does the same thing. So this is a field of thyme, sunflowers with cilantro behind it, and there's another herb behind that, and then tomatoes, there's, there's a rows of tomatoes. So that's kind of the scale that we're doing things in. It's commercial scale, but we're mixing where we can, we're mixing crops in fields. So bringing this all together, our paradigm is to encourage life. There's no reason we need to grow food in where you can't take a baby because there's a sign this cross and skull balls that says don't enter this field for 36 hours. That's a, this doesn't make any sense to grow food, something that we put in our body and have to use these kinds of poisons. It's understandable why we're using them, but it doesn't have to be that way. There is another paradigm, and that's encouraging life and learning from nature. Feeding the soil, improving the soil structure, encouraging species diversity, finding this insect balance that I was, some of these stories I was telling you, using this idea of habitats for insects, and understanding the whole system when something's out of, ra out of, out of whack and gone crazy. So I want to just diverge off to you know, sidetrack for a little bit, because I thought that I would be, it would be a mistake not to include this. A trend today in growing, growing vegetables is protected agriculture. Protected agriculture is using greenhouses and screen houses, structures with fine mesh all around them. So they have their pros and their cons. Of course, the big one is it modifies the environment, gives you more control of the space you're growing the plant in. It also limits the entry and also the exit of insects. It doesn't keep them out completely, unless you're really, really good but it limits them. So you, we have a case right now where the aphids are getting in and nothing else, and that's a problem. And we're, you're getting significantly higher yields because you can control the environment a little bit better. 2x or more. So just to give you some numbers, out in open fields we get between five and 6,000 boxes of cherry tomatoes in a hectare, which is 2.4 acres. In a shade house, am I running out of time? Uh, okay. In a shade house or in a greenhouse, we can get 10 to 12,000 boxes an acre. So the cons are high capital costs, maintenance, and the susceptibility to storm damage. So just that this idea of protected agriculture isn't new. The Chinese have been doing this for a long time. Uh, they were building earthen structures and they were covering them with straw mats at night to prevent the night radiation from going up. When cheap plastics came along, they incorporated, they incorporated them into what they were doing. You can see the, this is the same matting they used before there were plastics. They were using with the plastic to hold the heat in. And this is what it looks like inside. Very high population of plants. You can, you can barely walk through there. And the same thing that we're doing, a little more high tech. This is a plastic greenhouse. These are peppers. High population, the blue strips are to monitor insects. The white box, the white box is a box of bumblebees to pollinate the peppers. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like on the inside, These plants are, get to be 10 feet hot, tall. The uh, tomato plants can be 30 feet long. It, it's it's a, literally a forest of plants in these things. One of the strategies is to remove lower leaves after harvesting the cucumbers because we take off, those are where the, the disease tends to build up. We remove those leaves out of the greenhouses and it mitigates disease problems. 
It's another picture of popping the lower leaves. You can just get a sense of how many tomatoes are on these plants. So how much time do I have? Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the problems. These are nematodes. I, th I think this, these are beautiful pictures of nematodes, and I borrowed this from a, uh, a researcher at UC Riverside, Antone. But the one in the, where the arrow is, that's a plant parasitic nematode, and you can tell by the stylet. That's what it sticks into the plant to feed. And to give you a sense of how big, I don't know if you can see the little white thing under the blue arrow, that's how big they are. And that's what they do to the plants. You're not going to buy that carrot. You see it in the store. <laughs> so the, the best thing to do about these the nematodes is to breed for them. And we have a breeding program that we bred our tomato plants to be resistant to, to nematodes. But we also breed for flavor and for yield. Just to show you before we start breeding, that's what on your left is what our tomato plant roots look like and when we finished our breeding program now we have tomato plants the roots look like this so breeding is great we've done the same thing with a leaf disease alternaria affects the the leaves of the plant and after a few years we we're able to breed into our tomato leaves that aren't impacted by the, this disease and here's what it looks like in the field, and you can see your heart, if you're the grower, your heart's going to sink. But if you can have a plant that's resistant, you don't have to do anything. So disease, and especially soil diseases, can be the end of your day. And there was a couple of papers about soil fume against methyl bromide. And so that's the way typically soil diseases are dealt with, and nematodes are dealt with, with methyl bromide is kills everything. But there's some other tools. You can solarize your soil, which is just covering it with plastic, watering it, and letting it get really hot. Crop rotation helps. Compost helps. And there's this idea of seed mills, which I'm going to try to cover in 10 minutes, and anaerobic soil disinfection. Actually, Mary, are you going to cut your... You want to cut it off? I do. I'm sorry. I know people have to go clean after. So OK. I want to give them a chance to ask questions. All right. I'm going to show one. I'm going to show one slide. I just want to talk about the um, seed meals, the chemistry of seed meals. These are mustard seed meals. It turns out that mustard has glucosinolates in them. And inside the tissue of, of mustard plants and in the seed, there's an enzyme called myrosinase. And when you mix that enzyme with the glucosinolates, and add water, you get all these other chemicals. And these chemicals are biocidal and herbicidal. So it opens up the opportunity to use plants as tools in farming. 